coming up on Dialogue Weekend. The US has now reached 30 million confirmed cases of COVID-19, and the EU is calling for more controls on vaccine exports. US President Joe Biden joined a video conference with European leaders on Thursday in a bid to rebuild trust in the transatlantic alliance. And this week's newsmaker, now on Dialogue Weekend. Welcome to Dialogue Weekend. I'm Xu Qinduo. Nations around the world are eager to reopen their borders and kickstart their economies. But COVID-19 mutations and the delayed rollout of vaccines are proving serious challenges. The rise of cases in India, the U.S. and the European countries are sparking fresh concerns. Are we facing a new wave of COVID-19? How are the vaccination programs going in these countries? And what difficulties does the global rollout of vaccines face? And more, I'm joined by Dr. Megan Rani, an emergency physician at Brown University, Cui <coughs> Hongjian, Director of the Department of European Studies at the China Institute of International Studies, Joseph Gregory Mahoney, Professor of Politics at East China Normal University, and Fraser Cameron, Senior Advisor of the European Policy Center in Brussels. So I uh, will start with uh, Dr. Rani. Uh, here, if you look around the world, uh, we see the new development recently. For example, in India, we have this double mutant virus made the rising number of almost 50,000 a day uh, new cases. And in European, European Union in particular, some of the countries are actually extending or reimposing some of the restrictive measures. And in, even in the US, we are receiving the, the warning. People are talking about whether we are going to face a new surge of the cases over there. Uh, what went wrong? Or is there something we have done wrong? Why there is a new, almost like a new wave of cases there? It does seem, doesn't it, like every time that we think that the end is sight, the virus starts winning again. It is true that we are in the fifth straight week of rising cases across the globe, but it's complicated, right? We're seeing rising cases in India, in France, in Italy, in Chile, where the weather is starting to change. So as we go into the southern hemisphere, it's starting to get to be winter there. And we know that this virus, like most respiratory viruses, is going to be more common in winter months when people are spending time indoors. We also know that vaccine rollout has not been smooth across the globe. There Hello? Okay. And even in Europe and the United States, right, there are a lot of folks that have not been vaccinated yet. So it may just be that the virus is spreading to new people. We haven't reached herd immunity. We don't have the vaccine in enough bodies. And mutations are arising, which may allow people to get reinfected. I, my hope, many of our hopes, is that this new surge, although certainly deadly, will be less deadly than the prior surges simply because we are getting vaccines into arms a little more quickly um, and because of the proportion of the population that's already had the disease. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look at the U.S. situation, uh, the CDC is warning over the weekend, actually, that the nation is recording a seven-day average of about 57,000 new cases per day. Uh, basically, that represents 7% jump over the last week. I remember, if I'm correct, before that, actually, all the numbers are, were coming down in the U.S. because of the rather successful vaccination campaign. You know, U.S. is one of the probably a few countries uh, that have done uh, successfully in the vaccination of its own people. So is there anything wrong over there? So we've done a great job with vaccinations compared to most of the world, but even here, only about one in six people is fully vaccinated. So that leaves five in six who have not gotten a vaccine in arm, never mind all the kids who aren't even eligible for vaccines yet. In addition, most of the states are relaxing those public health restrictions. Some states have removed mask mandates altogether. Many are allowing increasing indoor dining, indoor gyms, parties, et cetera, all the things where we know that COVID spreads. So we're really stuck in this race against the, the vaccine and the virus. And unfortunately, because of these releases in public health res restrictions, it makes it easier for the virus to spread among folks who haven't been vaccinated yet. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Professor Mahoney, uh, you live in the States right now. Uh, 
you know, I, I understand the people's frustration. You know, people can't wait to reopen the business. You know, people say, you know, uh, we have been under the lockdown mode for too long time. Now we have the vaccination. You know, increasing number of people being uh, inoculated. You know, it's the time to reopen uh, the state, to reopen the city, the economy. Um, can we blame them? Well, I think it's, it's all of these things. Plus, of course, it's, it's the springtime and people, you know, they, they see the nice weather. They're excited to get outside. They're, they're, they're tired of the long, cold COVID winter. Uh, but I think what we're seeing is, is an intersection uh, of, of a couple of additional problems. One is that, you know, we have a, a fair amount of Democratic, uh, from the Democratic Party, some triumphalism that, uh, you know, is, is, is assuring people that this problem more or less has been solved and that we're going to move forward with it. And then, of course, we still have conservatives who have always denied it and always resisted any types of social distancing and social control. And then on top of this, we have uh, some mixed messages, right? On the one hand, uh, you know, we've, we're still telling people that you should continue to social distance, you should continue to mask. But then there's, you know, some messages that come from the CDC and other public health agencies that say that under certain circumstances, you no longer have to do this. If you know people have uh, been vaccinated or if they've been in certain cir circumstances where they have a lower risk. So I think there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of angst. There's a lot of desire to move forward. And we are at risk uh, seeing uh, uh, a surge as the numbers show uh, across the U.S. And, and particularly in Michigan in the past week. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll shift a little bit to uh, EU, European Union over there. Uh, so, uh, Fraser, you know, we have seen uh, mostly the European uh, countries, a couple of them at least, uh, they are reimposing the, uh, or extending uh, the restrictions and also in Germany's case, you know, um, uh, 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 Chancellor Merkel apologized for, you know, making the decision probably to, in too short a period of time, uh, but Easter uh, lockdown over there. But anyway, it gives people the sense of somehow we are still struggling to deal with uh, the virus. Uh, tell us, you know, uh, you know, what's going on and how confident or less confident people are about, uh, say, next month as you know, the weather is getting better and better? Well, it's complicated. I mean, firstly, at the meeting of the European Council on Thursday, they couldn't agree on how to distribute the, the vaccines in Europe. It's supposed to be done on a pro rata base, but some countries are falling behind and wanted more. It's largely to do with distribution problems from AstraZeneca, one of the largest providers. It's also tied up with disputes about how much should be exported and how much should stay in Europe. And of course, in the UK, they have done much better, but they've not exported any of the vaccines. So all of these issues make for a complicated situation, which has now got worse because, as you mentioned, there's been a new outbreak in France, in Germany, in Poland, in Italy, and new restrictions have been brought in, including some restrictions on cross-border travel again. So there's no easy path out of this. I think the restrictions will continue. One has to hope that the better weather will lead to a reduction in infections. But at the moment, it's not a very rosy picture here in Europe. Mm -hmm. What about the idea of um, the EU-wide, uh, what do you call it, like a vaccination pass, passport? Yeah. Uh, you know, what, what is, um, how much headway we are making? Well, this is a good idea. The European Commission came up with this um, a few weeks ago. They're still working on it. Everyone agrees in principle. It's a question of what are the criteria you use and what are the sort of moral, ethical implications if, if someone, for example, does not uh, refuses to have a, a vaccine, are they still not allowed to cross a border or go on holiday? So it's, it's quite complicated, but I think they're working on it. And certainly the countries in the south of Europe, very dependent on tourism, are wanting this passport introduced as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, well, if you uh, move beyond, say, India, US, EU, uh, European continent, and uh, to the rest of the world, the developing world mostly, um, the World Health Organization, uh, the, the Director General, uh, Dr. Tendris, uh, has criticized for quite some time uh, vaccine nationalism, you know, inequality of a vaccine uh, distribution, calling it uh, grotesque. Uh, said the situation is increasingly becoming more absurd. Uh, Hong Jian, I want to have your opinion. You know, how can we break out this crisis? How can we try our best to share the vaccines as much as possible? 
regarding to this current situation for its vaccine, I mean, uh, distribution uh, in the world wider, we can find the, the uh, situation uh, as uh, bad as possible. If we understand that uh, the nature of uh, COVID-19, uh, we, we should end any, I mean, uh, to try to provide any uh, country for uh, vaccines. And also, once there is any country could not uh, stop this uh, uh, tendency, so it's difficult to say that uh, there will be end for the uh, pandemic. So now I think the difficult situation, uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, but we need to do something uh, even uh, starting from now. For example, firstly, uh, it's very really, uh, extremely necessary for uh, more uh, cooperation on different levels between the institutions, between countries, and even between regions. Uh, because we understand even now there is a WHO, it has a, a program of the COVAX for the multi, uh, multipolar, uh, I mean, uh, multilateral uh, cooperation for this uh, vaccine uh, uh, cooperation. But now the problem for the WHO is uh, how could it get some more, uh, I mean, authorities or competen uh, competences from the uh, countries. So I think that uh, there will be a, a, a space for the cooperation between WHO and the G20 and some mm -hmm. other multi, uh, mul uh, multilateral uh, uh, institutions. And the second is how could those uh, uh, rich countries uh, which uh, get uh, or which are ordered uh, most uh, percentage of the uh, vaccine uh, before, they could try to contribute more to some, uh, I mean, poor countries. Uh, the uh, lack of the uh, capability uh, to get the vaccines. And the third is, I think it's very important for the international community to try to have, a, I mean, general standard for any kind of uh, vaccine. And then uh, stop the, uh, to stop any kind of uh, efforts of uh, particularization of a vaccine. So once it happens, I think the, there will be more resources for the international community, especially for the poor uh, countries, to, uh, to be provided of the uh, vaccines. Mm -hmm. well, Dr. Rani, is it possible, as Hong Jian said, that let's say, you know, uh, vaccine, we have vaccines actually from US, Germany, UK, uh, Russia, China, India, as long as it is approved in one country, let's just use it and make it simpler, make it faster. Uh, distributed around the world. Is that possible? That would be a dramatic, dramatic change from our traditional process of drug manufacturing. And I can say that in the United States, that would be extremely unlikely to be possible. We set up our Food and Drug Administration because of issues with drugs. If you'll remember back in the 50s, thalidomide that was used in Europe, brought into the United States, caused birth defects in children. That was one of the drivers for our establishment of our drug administration process at the FDA. I don't see the United States um, ceding approval of its drugs and vaccines to other countries. EU, sure. Um, could you create some sort of other body for other groups of countries? Probably. Um, but ultimately, each country's government has to be able to speak to its own populace as to the safety and efficacy of the drugs in their own country. Mm -hmm. Well, it was, uh, obviously, it will take some time uh, to have people uh, access uh, the <coughs> vaccine, whatever or wherever they are from. Well, thank you, Dr. Rennie. Now let's turn to the EU summit uh, later that uh, last week, actually, uh, this week, where U.S. President Joe Biden was invited as a guest. It's the first time in more than a decade that the president of the United States has joined the event. What did the leaders of the 28 countries discuss at the summit? Does the re-entry of the U.S. leader mean the two sides are rapidly repairing the damage done to the relationship under Trump? And what kind of role will the EU play in the global geopolitical landscape? Well, Mr. Fraser, so we'll start with you. What's your takeaways? You know, what are the major uh, priorities uh, or top of the agenda for the EU summit? Well, I think the most important thing was that Biden accepted the invitation to come and appear with all the 27 heads of state and government in Europe. That was a big step forward. 
And of course, people were just simply pleased that uh, after four years of Trump's neglect of transatlantic relations, you have a president in the White House who wants to work with the EU on major issues like uh, climate change, like uh, digital, uh, dealing with Russia, etc. So I think that was uh, there was no decisions taken here. It was simply a get to know you. We're back in business. We want to work together. So the atmospherics have changed completely now. And I think that was the main outcome, in fact, of the summit. Mm -hmm. uh, so do we know the two sides, you know, what are the specific progress being made between uh, President Biden and uh, the European uh, Union countries over there? Well, it depends on the issue. I mean, on climate change, he's invited a number of European leaders to his own uh, summit, in, uh, along with President Xi Jinping in April in, in Washington. So climate will be a, a top priority this year, leading up to COP26 uh, in Glasgow that there are contentious issues, but I think the administration certainly wants to work with the EU on dealing with um, trade disputes, um, ideas about a new digital tax, for example. There's quite a lot of um, problem areas that we were not resolved during, in fact, worsened during the Trump administration. For example, the US still imposes tariffs on European steel and aluminium on the basis of the national security. So there's a number of these issues that have to be sort of dealt with. But at the same time, the Biden team really does want to work with the EU on a whole range of global issues. So everyone in Europe is basically cautiously pleased now that we have the opportunity to renew the transatlantic relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Professor Mahoney, uh, what do you think the U.S. is expecting out of uh, the European Union? Or, you know, after the summit, uh, do you think the U.S. side gets uh, what they wish for? You know, I think above all, uh, uh, the, the specter of Trump is, is haunting Europe. And, you know, this creates in incredible incentives uh, to work with Biden, particularly as he has uh, extended an olive branch on many fronts, including uh, some of the issues that are, that are you know, held dear, uh, especially in Europe. Uh, they're, they're held dear in, in many places, but, but climate change is, is perhaps uh, a bigger, m more popular issue in Europe than it is in the United States. So, you know, these are the sort of issues that uh, Europeans are, are very much devoted to. And I think that they're, they're willing to go along uh, with some of the more uncomfortable things that uh, Biden might be proposing with respect to Russia uh, and China, um, in, in part because they, uh, Europe itself is, is still uh, facing its own uh, COVID surge. It's still dependent on the United States for the most part, for, for security. Um, and, you know, uh, they already had the, the difficulty uh, related to Brexit and, uh, as we've seen, uh, the vaccine campaign. So I think Europe is in a very vulnerable position right now. Uh, Biden is offering them some leadership. Uh, he's talking to some of their core issues. And uh, I think they're going to go along with some of the things that, that they might not otherwise like to go along with because they feel like uh, if they don't, uh, if Biden doesn't succeed, they may have to face Trump or someone like Trump four years down the line. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Hong Jian, uh, the U.S. clearly wants uh, a united front with the EU on its shared values. You know, at the summit, uh, President Biden spoke about freedom, human rights, and said defending them is the most important battle of the 21st century. Uh, so what do you make of uh, Biden's message that, you know, democratic countries, mostly uh, U.S. and European countries, should set the rules of the global order? I think the uh, real meaning for uh, President Biden for this so-called uh, democratic countries union could be a Western countries union, because I think it showed a lot of uh, difference, uh, especially between China and the U.S. on this issue. If we look at what happened in uh, Anchorage recently, uh, I think uh, now, of course, for United States, it tried to take use of the concept of the. Uh, uh, democracy and try to, uh, you know, uh, create a kind of uh, conflict between so-called Western uh, democratic countries and the other. Of course, uh, a very, very uh, important as an instrument for United States, try to find out the, uh, I mean, confrontation between so-called uh, uh, Western de democracy and the Eastern uh, authoritarian regimes like that. So I think. Uh, now the Chinese side or some other uh, countries will, si will argue that uh, who, uh, we, who will have the full 
I mean, capability and the competence to define what's a democracy. And uh, Mr. Biden uh, mentioned that uh, freedom and also uh, 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 human rights and everything. But I think at the same time, China and some other countries always take uh, all of these uh, very, very important values as co-value. So I think it's uh, very uh, dangerous for the uh, United States try to uh, have this uh, uh, divided line between uh, Western countries and the other. Once it happens, I think there will be more and more ideologic conflicts in international community. At the same time, I, if we, if the, uh, I mean, international community will go along with this uh, direction, uh, I think there will be more uh, risk for so-called uh, new Cold War. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel uh, did say that the EU has a lot in common with the U.S., but uh, it clearly differs on China policy. And also we know um, probably U.S. and the European Union is not really agreeing uh, yet, at least, on this Nord Stream 2 uh, pipe dream uh, project over there. Uh, so, Fraser, uh, how, how big a difference is that, you know, between uh, the U.S. and the Brussels over there, over China policy, over their Russian policy? In Russia, I don't think there's a, a huge difference. I mean, America accepted Nord Stream 1, so the question about Nord Stream 2 has arisen, I think, largely because of the lobbying by uh, Ukraine and Poland. But there are ways around to defuse the issue, and I think it's not going to be a uh, a real rift because of the um, Nord Stream 2. I think the reason that the US last week came out talking about sanctions again was simply to get um, Bill Burns confirmed as the director of the CIA because some senators had put a block on his confirmation until the administration said they were going to be tough on, on Nord Stream. On China, I think there was an open recognition by Biden and Tony Blinken that there will be differences as well as commonalities in the approach of the United States and the EU towards China. We have different interests, that's obvious. They both agreed on that. But we also both share various um, values and we want to stand up for these values. So I think it's going to be a mixed picture in dealing with both China and Russia. Mm -hmm. Well, let's uh, leave it there for now and take a look at this week's Newsmaker. So Colton is at the core of the international disputes. Uh, Professor Mahoney, you know, H&M, Nike, Adidas, and other foreign brands have boycotted the Xinjiang Colton. Uh, this has caused a blowback on the Chinese internet, the social media over there in particular. So why is Xinjiang Colton suddenly being boycotted by, you know, these foreign companies? And then there's a blowback from the Chinese side. Well, let's be clear. You know, a lot of Western companies over the past year, and, and more than that, actually, have been under incredible pressure uh, in the West from both the left and the right uh, to uh, uh, cease uh, dealing with, uh, with uh, anything related to Xinjiang, whether it's cotton, whether it's Uyghur labor in other parts of China. Uh, and in fact, we should, we should be honest and say that, that a lot of Western companies have been encouraged to decouple from China altogether. And so given you know, the hysteria that we've seen in the Western media and from some Western leaders over Xinjiang, it's not surprising that, the, that this was sort of the breaking point for some of these companies. But let's also be clear that you know, we're, we're looking at H&M, which has a long history as, as a leader in the fast fashion industry, of being a tremendous uh, contributor to the exploitation of labor worldwide. Uh, and, and the worst examples are not in, in China. Um, and being a significant contributor to pollution. And with, in, in the case of uh, Nike, you know, we have a, a CEO who signed, uh, a, a, who, who signed and started with Nike in 2019 with a $45 million signing bonus. Uh, last year, his compensation was $53 million. Uh, the, the executive board across, uh, across all the senior positions, they saw increases in their salary of 20 to 40 percent in a year when a lot of people, a lot of Americans, a lot of people around the world were suffering. So I think the idea that these companies are in some way, uh, you know, 
uh, the answer to social justice or that they can occupy a moral high ground is laughable. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, uh, Professor, you have been in China for quite uh, some years. You understand the Chinese situation problem much better than many, many people in the West. Uh, uh, we know, you know, some of the allegations, for example, forced labor. Uh, in Xinjiang, uh, the cotton uh, basically is picked, 70% of them is picked by, by machines, not by human beings. And also, if you look at the other parts of the allegation, uh, so-called uh, you know, young people from Xinjiang area were transferred to the eastern part of China, more developed, rich regions to work over there. But that's China's part of the practice of uh, poverty alleviation uh, because there's a surplus in the western regions in China. So you organize those young people and they find the jobs in a particular factory in Qingdao, in Shanghai, in an organized way because they are not familiar with the situation. Not exactly forced labor. Uh, so is that a part of the misunderstanding over there or mis, uh, you know, misconception? I think it's part of it. But to, to, be, to be again clear, there is, there is sort of a feeding frenzy, a hysteria that's been promoted. It, it started under the Trump administration with Pompeo, uh, these, claims of, uh, these false claims of genocide that have been again repeated by Blinken. Uh, and uh, we've seen this uh, accelerating in ways that have just created this whole toxic narrative so that anything now related to Xinjiang, anything related to China, is in some way evil. And I think it's really, really uh, uh, damaging because, you know, ultimately, if you really care about the people of Xinjiang, if you really care about uh, uh, their progress and their economy, you shouldn't start penalizing them and blaming them for things, even if you believe that those uh, allegations are true. Good point. Uh, uh, well, Hongjian over there, you know, the, uh, another actually organization involved, uh, uh, in, involved in this uh, you know, big dispute is uh, the Battery Cotton Initiative, or BCI. Uh, its China office says no forced labor has been found in Xinjiang over the past eight years. Uh, but the government pressure in Washington and the UK has forced some of the companies to make a choice or to choose a side, let's say. Uh, do you see any evidence in all of those uh, allegations over there? So far, I think there are a lot of the uh, um, confusions of the uh, information and even some uh, disinformation. Uh, if we look at the uh, original I mean, situation is, undoubtedly, uh, this kind of uh, issue of uh, uh, cotton in Xinjiang could be arranged uh, to uh, uh, Trump administration in last year. Uh, it uh, has the so-called the rule to, uh, uh, you know, uh, boycott the uh, uh, cotton from Xinjiang. And of course, and then there are some uh, uh, discussion about the BCI, just like you mentioned, the institute, and also the consumers and the sailors from some uh, Western countries. So now there are a lot of, uh, I mean, confusion of uh, uh, information. But now I think that uh, we need to try to make clear what's the real uh, situation, what's the truth. Like even now, the BCI announced that uh, it uh, uh, has not taken any action uh, against the uh, uh, cotton from Xinjiang. But we need to understand what's the relations between some uh, uh, countries, especially the governments, and, uh, and those uh, sailors and uh, also producers uh, in uh, uh, Western countries like H&M uh, and, and also some other, I mean, very, very popular brand in Chinese market. So I think that now, uh, the question is, once there are some more and more truths, more and more and the, I mean, uh, information uh, provided, I think now it will be clear that uh, uh, it's a very uh, difficult uh, for the uh, United States or for, for any other uh, governments try to, uh, I mean, uh, fight against with China uh, by taking use of the issue of uh, uh, cotton in Xinjiang. As we know that uh, uh, no matter what's the big market in China and the very, very big interests uh, for these uh, mm -hmm. uh, sailors and producers from other countries. And also at the same time, I think that... Uh, we are how running we out of time. Thank you, yes. Hong Jian. But with that, we are coming to the end of today's show. Many thanks to our guests. You can also watch us on the CGTN app on YouTube. I'm Xu Qinduo. Thank you for watching. See you next week. <laughs>